five, four, three, two, one. The podcast will start. The Porsche Sport Podcast, powered by Porsche Center Leeds. Test drive the new Porsche Taycan and experience soul electrified. Porsche Mobile One Super Cup, Formula E, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, 24 hour series, Porsche Carrera Cup, Endurance Motorsports, British GT, Porsche Club Great Britain, Sim Racing. The Porsche Sport Podcast. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Porsche Sport Podcast because joining me today is. Well, some people refer to as the godfather of sports car racing, Stefan Rattel. Stefan, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. I mean, godfather of GT racing, maybe. Sports <laughs> car is a bit too wide for me. I am not, I'm not very knowledgeable in prototypes. <laughs> You're modest as as always. Now, Stefan, you've had an incredible career, and um, you know in, across so many different types of of racing and stuff. But cars, actually, from what I understand, cars weren't around your your life when you were a child. It was when you became a young adult when the the vice of uh, fast cars came into your life. And I uh, and I often say that the first race I went to is the first one I organized. I had never been to a race before. I've been on racetrack because I I, I was enjoying a, a, a Porsche club when I was 19 years old. So, you know, I, I, I did drive on racetrack, but I've never been to a race. So, uh, but I've had a, a passion for cars since I'm, yeah, since I'm a, a teenager. Yes. And one of those, I remember reading a story about one of those uh, early times when you had a Jaguar E-Type and you and a friend took it to the Autobahn. And the reason why I bring this up is because it was against the Porsche. And of course, we're the Porsche Sport Podcast. So why don't you tell us the story about that? The story is really true. (laughs) My godfather used to live in the the east of France and we wanted to go to visit um, the the Musée National Automobile in Mulhouse, you know, the collection, very, very big car collection. So we went from Strasbourg down to Mulhouse and we came back on the, on the German motorway and I was with the E-Type and a friend next to me and the Porsche did pass us and the friend went like, go, 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 go. <laughs> you know, and in, in Germany, you can drive. The, the, there was no, already at the time, there was no speed limit. And I went all the way 200, 220, 240, which was one in E-Type, but it was a bit too much. And suddenly, um, bang, and the engine went. But I mean, really went, you know, with the oil dripping. I mean, the engine was gone. Yeah, so that was my, uh, and after that, I said, yeah, you know, I need a Porsche. So I've been, I've been a Porsche fan for many, 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 many years, ever since I think I, and the first one, I was 19 years old, and I was welcome, I think, as the youngest member of the Porsche Club of France. And uh, was meant to happen, happen. I crashed it after months of having it. So I went into, into getting it prepared. Um, at the time, it was initially an SC with a three-liter engine, and we, we fitted a 3.2-liter with double exhaust. And, uh, and that was a, a beginning of a, of a big passion. Then at the Club Porsche, you know, they started at the time where, I mean, I'm talking the early 80s. Huh? Mm-hmm. Then started to come, the, the, uh, they rediscovered the 2.7 RS. So I had a 2.7 RS. Oh, wow. A, a three liter RS that I raced, I raced, that I enjoyed. It was no racing. It was like track days. A three-liter RS, beautiful car, red with the, the gold striped RS that I enjoyed for a number of years, and, and then so on and so on. You know, I had the chance of having a number of of nice Porsches. I the nicest imagine. of them being a nine nine seventeen Golf car that I that I like uh, like uh, which was probably the biggest mistake of my life to sell about twelve years ago. Big mistakes. Oh my. Big mistake. That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I should have done? Instead of organizing all these races, I should have kept the car and go on the beach for the last 12 years and probably <laughs> made more money. But, you know, 
Not the way life goes. <laughs> and of course, you know, trading, um, you know, there's obviously this, some people would, that's the most cars any people would own in their lifetime. But for you, it seems like, you know, trading cars has been a, a big part uh, in the early days. But I want to know about Miami Vice, Stefan, with the white Lamborghini Countach and the white suit and the gold Rolex in California. Yeah. Tell me about that time. <laughs> No, that's when I, I moved to America because I finished after having enjoyed my university time in France. I went to finish uh, my studies in America, San Diego State University, international business. And instead of, I mean, in addition to studying international business, I decided to practice by um, importing to Europe what was <clears throat> named the gray market cars, which was basically in the mid 80s the dollar was very, very, very high. So a lot of parallel import was done. You know, US car dealer would come to Europe, they would buy Porsches, Lamborghini, Ferraris, and all this, completely European spec, they would bring it to America. That was about 85, 86. And a couple of years later, the dollar has went the other way around. And these cars in America, you know, they didn't have, at the time, the US car had bigger bumper, they had injection, and these carbureted, smaller original bumper cars were called gray market cars and they were not they were difficult to uh, assure they were uh, to ensure they were difficult to you know the the, the dot all these special emission rules they don't work very well so i started to buy one now i brought back to europe and i sold it for a very good profit at the time, just saying, there was no internet. There was not, you know, you people didn't know. So you could just, and they were literally a price. So I bought a second one and a third one. And I started at a, good, at a young age to start making decent money. So I awarded myself with a, with a, with a Countach, white on white, that I bought at a DEA, at a, at a drug enforcement um, <laughs> auction. <laughs> Uh, drug enforcement auction and and yeah that was that was a good time between uh, in Los Angeles in the 80s the late 80s that was a, a very good time and I enjoyed the car for a long time and that started my second passion after Porsche which were Lamborghinis and uh, for 10 years I drove almost daily Countach first out of 4000 S then a 5000 and a QV and I've been loving these cars which were actually very good cars you know very good cars. Uh, and they're still are. They're fun to drive. But this would be before the times of when they were bought by Audi as well, I guess. Yeah, I'm talking. Uh, yeah. yeah. Many, many, Long many years before. before. I'm talking the 80s here. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking <laughs> the 80s. I'm an old man, you know. It's, I mean, an old man. Not old, but I'm not as, you know, I'm a bit older than I look, some people say. <laughs> It's always good to be that way around. So after you've 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 come back to you come back home to to Paris and you have a party and you organize a race from Paris to Saint Tropez. What bearing in mind this is broadcast, uh, what can you tell us about that first race that you organized? No, it's very simple because I I, <laughs> I did this um, I did this car import and and other. Then I, I moved. I lived in London uh, where I had a, a fashion shop. So I was, you know, it was a, a cool business to do, to trade cars and, and, and be on Sloan Street selling, uh, uh, you know, fashion. Uh, but that end with the Gulf War, you know, the, the, there was really a crisis in the, mm. in the 90s, no, early 90s, I'm talking 1991, and the car market crashed completely from one day to the other, you know, because then you had this bubble effect, the cars, by the time I was buying a car in America, and putting it in a container, by the time it had arrived in Europe, it had taken 20, 30% up. You know, so we were making really, it was all good. So I was buying more and more cars. And uh, at some point, you know, the bubble effect, one auction goes, goes, and nothing sells. And then what everybody wanted simply to make a profit on, nobody wanted anymore. So I ended up with many cars. Uh, I had to close my fashion business because it didn't work very well anymore. And uh, I said, what to do? So I moved back to Paris and I decided to invite all my clients and friends because of my friends, I had made clients. Of my clients, I had made friends because we were still young, all of us. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do a housewarming party in Paris. And the first one in Saint-Tropez win the cup. So about 1,100 kilometers going through the center of France. 
And I have to say, many of my friends came, some of them from America with their cars, and we had so much fun that they all wanted to do it again. And it was, in fact, the first podium I ever organized on the beach in Saint-Tropez, giving cups and everything. <laughs> they all said, it's fantastic, and fantastic, we want to do it again. But my friend and roommate in America was doing what I was doing in international business. He was doing the law school. So he was the, you know, he was the, the reasonable guy of, of the group. And he came to me and said, you know, you've been very lucky. All of your friends are there. Nobody got hurt. But if you do it again and someone has a problem, you'll, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. So that's how it came to say, you know what? We should do it on a racetrack next time. And all my friends liked the idea. Then it's how I started the business. And th- this, was, uh, this was when the Venturi Trophy was born, yeah, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Then I was, that was uh, introduced to, to, to a, a friend, uh, one of my friends that had, uh, had a connection with, with Venturi. And he came to me and said, oh, you know, you should go and see. I said, Venturi? What is, what is Venturi? You know, with Renault Peugeot engines. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm, I love, I'm into Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Aston Martin, Porsches, okay, okay, Venturi. <laughs> But I did go a bit dragging my feet. I came to this little factory, which was in Nantes, not very far from Le Mans, with a group, in fact, highly racing oriented and dedicated because many of, of them were uh, ex people of Rondo. Rondo were the first oh, yeah. one to, to win Le Mans. Um, so they were really, really keen on racing. And they said, you know, if you, with your friend, you go on a racetrack with a Countach of, you know, at the time there was the car that existed, or a Testarossa, you'll do three laps and you won't have any brakes, any gearbox, <laughs> any engine, any anything. <laughs> Don't remember, uh, you know, the, the engineering at the time was not what it is today. And, um, and but we can create for you a very good car. So they did. They presented a prototype and, and I went to my friend and, you know, with the objective initially of selling 20 cars, 24 cars, and it was a huge success because the car was looking good. All my friends were eager to go racing. I mean, they didn't have the idea before, but I said, you know, it would be so much fun. We're all there. We're all going to go on a racetrack and we're going to have fantastic weekends. And at the end, we sold 74 cars which made it, I think, the largest one-make series, at least in the GT world at the time in Europe. Wow. Now it was very, very, very big. And, uh, and we, had, we had a fantastic time. And it was very international. It was born, we had more than 20 different nationalities and a lot, a lot of fun. We did one of the biggest, we did a race at Le Mans before the 24 hours of the one make race. I think we had something like 55 cars at the start of that race. No, it was, it was really special, very, very successful. And then one of my clients was uh, Count Ricardo Augusta, you know, the Yes, MVP, the, yes I mean, absolutely. And he came to me and said, you know, I've, before I'm too old, I'd like to go to Le Mans. Can we prepare the car to go to Le Mans? But at the time, Le Mans didn't have any GT car. It was only prototypes in 92. So I went to the ACO. We started discussing, and that's how I modestly contributed to the return of of GT at Le Mans. And I came the first year with seven cars. So imagine there is a guy who started in the racing world a year ago, who's basically never been to a serious race, and who comes to Le Mans with seven entries and seven cars. <laughs> but we did okay. We've put five of them to the finish. So we gained some respectability. And, uh, and that's how the story goes. Then my clients, to who I sold um, these Venturi LM cars to go to Le Mans. After they did Le Mans, they told me, okay, you sold us the car. What do we do with it now? What do we do with it? With the, I don't know. You do Le Mans next year. No, 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 no. We love them because they all had Venturi Trophy, but the Le Mans car was, you know, that was a serious race car with serious suspension, Ulan gearbox. I mean, that was feeling like a race car. And they said, no, 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 no. We want to do something again. But I had only seven of them, six of them initially. So to do a race with six cars was not a lot of fun. And then I saw that ah, this friend, he had an F40 kind of 
Ferrari F40 kind of race prepared. This one, he has kind of a Porsche racing in America. I don't know. We should do a GT race. And that's how we did in 93, the first really pan-European uh, GT race at Paul Ricard. And on this, on this occasion, I had one Porsche team by the name of Aberture, Swiss team. And they said, this is fantastic. And they called Jürgen Bart, who was at the time the, the, the manager, GT manager at Porsche, who wanted to meet me. And we met then with Patrick Peter mm -hmm. and we created the BPR series. And then the story goes. And that was in, 90, in 94. In 94. This is a period of time that many people will remember these cars, the F40 LM, the uh, Lamborghinis, the, like you say, the Venturi, all those kinds of things. But then McLaren turned up with a spaceship. They turned up with the F1 GTR, which then cleared, cleared the floor and then everyone all of a sudden is very unhappy. And then Porsche turn up with an even more of a spaceship. Tell us they about didn't the, the floor entirely because that, <laughs> in addition to being in addition to being a partner into the, the, the promotion company organizing the championship, I also had a, I was a partner in the team, uh, and we had an F40 Le Mans. Yes, uh, the first one that we brought into into the series, which many people remember it was it's a blue car by the color of pilot pen mm -hmm. and uh, and we did beat McLaren in understopped in in 95 which was <laughs> the only race that McLaren lost so they did they sweep the floor yes but not completely uh, but they did you know because at the time it's very simple that was before BOP yeah. you know, before balance of performance so mm -hmm. it's always the same story you start with road going cars that you prepare to go racing according to a certain regulation. And then obviously the best car wins, logical. And the best car at the beginning was the F40 because it was the most race prepared. And then McLaren came with the F1 GTR, which at the time was the best road car available. And then it won everything. And if you're Porsche, they started putting bigger turbos and bigger turbos and bigger wings and bigger flares. <laughs> they couldn't beat the McLaren. So the next thing they did was to put the engine in the, uh, the center of the car. I think they've done something like this in GTLM more recently. Mm -hmm. they did, um, yeah. And then suddenly they could, they, could, they could compete. The problem is it was a bit outside of the, of the rule, of the spirit of the rule, because the spirit of the rule you know, to say you take a road car to go racing and you don't build a race car and then make a, a road car homologation to be able to go racing. And at the time we, we had, we were three partners in the BPR. And when the project arrived, we had to decide if it was acceptable or not. Patrick Peter, who was a wise man with a good understanding of racing and the <laughs> story of it, was of course against it. Jürgen Bart was working for Porsche, so he couldn't really say he was against it. So he did vote for it. And the decision came to me. We could have rejected it, but I said, you know, it just looks beautiful. And when I see the price of this Porsche GT1 today, you will agree with me that it was not the wrong decision to make. <laughs> and I said, okay, let the story go. And uh, and I, and we are allowed for the, the car to come. And then McLaren had to, to react by doing the long tail cars and and and, uh, and Mercedes then came with the CLK GTR and the story went and then Toyota, closed the chapter by producing the Toyota GT1. Yes. They didn't even bother about the 25 unit. They produced one road car and it was back in full prototype. So you have the perfect illustration how it goes from, you know, having road cars and then race cars homologated for the road and then race cars. Basically the old story of GT becoming GTP, GT prototype. And they tried to do it again in 2004 with, with Maserati, with the MC12 coming with the same idea. <laughs> then Max Mosley, by the time president of the FIA, stopped it and said, you know what? We're not going to ban this car. We're going to balance it. And I'm like, what? What are you going to do? Yeah, we're going to balance it. Nobody had any idea of balancing cars. It was maybe in NASCAR in America, they were doing things like this, but it was the antithesis of racing. Mm -hmm. 
So I can tell you I've had a hard time convincing my clients at the time that the right thing to do would be to come and balance the cars. But we did, and it started the real success of GT Racing. It, it, I completely agree with you. I mean, in the early days, how did you... Obviously, there's lots of different ways to balance the performance of cars. Some have been very successful. Some have not been so successful. In the early days, how did you implement balance of performance at the time? Is it the same measures that we see today, or was it a little bit more basic at that time? The, the concept came, came was well, the same about that. The, well, the, from the beginning, it was weight, right mm-hmm. height, aero, and power, restrict, mm-hmm. engine restrictor. So these four parameters were being used. Simply, if you see from, you have two types, you have what I would say, balance of performance and adjustment of performance. You balance what we did at the beginning. You know, if you look in at the beginning of GT3, we were trying to balance a, a BMW Alpina with a, with a Morgan. If you look at both cars, you think there is really a very significant balancing act to perform there. In GT1 at the time, we had maybe with the MC12 was, was a real balancing act because the MC12 unbalance would have been on the different league. But between the other cars, the 550 Maranello, Corvette C6, uh, an Aston DBR, DBR9, all of these were cars which were quite close in performance. So to balance, to it was more adjusting the performance than really balancing. The balancing act today is, I would say, more in GT4, where we also have yeah. a very large diversity of cars, where you yeah. have a, an Alpine against, uh, against uh, you know, uh, an M4 or, or, yeah. or a Camaro. You know, you have very different cars or, yeah. or a KTM, you know. So that is also a complex balancing, mm-hmm. while in GT3 today, even if they look very different, the cars are uh, about the same weight, the same power, and their aero definition is about is about similar. There mm-hmm. is still a lot of work to do, and we have a, a, a fantastic uh, technical director who performed an amazing balance of performance mm-hmm. across all our championship and series. But mm-hmm. it has proven to work. I mean, that what created GT racing of today. It the, ra- the, the the racing is so close. The cars are so close in performance that it's down to the teams and the drivers to make the difference. And that creates this incredible racing we have at the moment. I don't know. I mean, you've seen Spa. I hope. I mean, who wins this 24-hour race with, you know, eight eight cars in the same lap at the end? And 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 it's all about you change tire, you don't change tires. And you're, I mean, it was one of the best races we ever had, I have to say. It, but it was. Did the same thing at Paul Ricard. I mean, Porsche won it at Spa, and Porsche lo- lost it at Ricard. Same thing, on the trick of tire changing, where at Ricard, the Ferrari changed only two tires, gained 12 seconds, and it was like, are they going to last? Are they going to last? Are they going to last? <laughs> I mean, uh, and they lasted, and, and also Porsche. I mean, it's incredible at Spa that they lost the gearbox like in the last lap. And I mean, full of drama. The best, to my opinion, it's the best racing you can see today. I mean, with the number of cars, the number of pro cars, the comp- how tight the competition is, is just amazing from an entertaining point standpoint. You know, mm-hmm. if you like the star system and you want to see only the famous Formula One drivers and everything, okay, fine, might be something else. Or if you love the, the you loved because now it's a bit changing, but the the technicity of LMP1 and all of this, I understand. But from, from a pure entertainment. Door to door, nose to tail, and uncertainties to the very end of its race. GT racing, I think, is, is, is the best at the moment. Well, NASCAR maybe, but I'm, I'm not following NASCAR very closely. <laughs> it's a different discipline, isn't it? I mean, that it's. I think you're absolutely right. It's it's interesting. I mean, for me, I think the I totally agree. The balance of performance has saved GT racing and preserved it for the time we live in today, and the way that the motorsport world is looking, but. If you looked at the last two years at Le Mans, which of course is um, organized by another company, by the ACO. Very and, good. Uh, yeah. Association. Yes, exa- exactly. And it's, 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 exactly. Now, the last two years in the GT, they've made two late changes to the balance of performance, very late in the day. 
and it's completely killed the performance last year with Aston Martin and this year with Porsche. Do you, to me, I don't, from a fan's perspective, I don't see that they're applying the balance of performance as accurately as others. Do, how do you assess how they're applying the balance of performance? Do you think they're doing it correctly? I, I wouldn't criticize my friend at Le Mans because sure. really, essentially, we have the best we have the sure. best relation with the ACO. Uh, but they have a more difficult job. It's very simple yeah. because okay. us in GT3 now, we, as you know, we organize 14 different championship and series around the world, six or seven of them with GT3 cars. Mm-hmm. We also monitor and, 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 and do BOP services for championship which are not ours, like the GT3 category in Super GT in Japan mm-hmm. or the uh, G- ADAC GT Master. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we get, our technical director, get plenty of data from so many races on okay. so many circuits with the same cars in the hands of different drivers and teams that mm-hmm. out of all these data you can extract the performance of the car independently of the drivers and of the teams. Mm-hmm. If now you be you balance one grid, whatever it's WEC or it's you know, or two grids taking IMSA, and then you mm-hmm. even have mm-hmm. some differences. It's very difficult to sure. separate the performance of the car from the performance of, of its environment, drivers, yes. team, and so on. And especially, and it's not to point the finger at anybody, and especially when one race of the championship is so much more important yeah. than all the other races together and maybe of the championship itself, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is that the, the temptation of possibly not showing the true pictures all the way could, <laughs> could be there. While in GT3, it's very difficult because as much as Spa is our Blue Ribbon event, you've got a lot of, you know, manufacturers and teams, they want to win Bathurst. They want to win Macau. They want to win Suzuka. They want to win. So, you know, in the GT3 constellation, Spa may be the best, but you've got many others which are valuable enough that they won't just sacrifice everything just to win Spa. Why lovers in, uh, in, you know, Le Mans is Le Mans. <laughs> it's, it shows how important it is still to, to the manufacturer. Le Mans is just huge. Well, let's, let's talk about Le Mans because, you know, GT3 category has been so successful and still the GTE cars are finding new customers all the time, but the manufacturers are pulling away from GTE with their factory efforts. To me, the GT, although there are differences between a GTE car and a GT3, to the fan, they offer quite a similar product. They're a top-level GT car that look like you're based on a, a road design. Do you think that there's a future for the adoption of GT3 in ACO racing? For from my conversation with them so far, I, I didn't see the the appetite mm-hmm. yet of, of adopting GT3. For having known the ACO and worked close to them or with mm-hmm. them because I was also, you know, I was a partner mm-hmm. in, in the Le Mans series. We, mm-hmm. we launched the Le Mans series in 2004 or five. Uh, so I've been partner with Le Mans. And all, what I know is they like to have their own categories mm-hmm. and to control their own categories. So I don't know what the future will tell us, but maybe they will take the some the base of GT3, but I wouldn't mm-hmm. surprise, wouldn't be surprised that they would, they would make it their own way, and that they would want a GT3 plus or a GT yeah. mine. And GT at the moment, you know, you might have less manufacturers, but you have a lot of privateers that want to go yeah. to look. Exactly. So you know, it all depends, and we we will see the success of with LMDH, with Hypercar, with LMP2. How many GTs they will need? To, you know, I, I don't know. This is a question to ask the ACO, not, not me. But of my personal opinion, uh, I, I, I would think that they would prefer to have their own class. But that's only my, because you asked me the question. 
You know, very honest indeed. No, thank you. Now, uh, last couple of questions, because we know you have a, a, another call. Um, you, you have a most incredible portfolio of events and championships, like you mentioned, Bathurst and Spa and Indianapolis and Suzuka. But uh, is, there, is there one event that, that's missing for you that you would love to have in the, in the portfolio in SRO? Le Mans. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. <laughs> you know, I can tell you when, really when, First of all, when it was in 2001, when, when the late uh, uh, Chaumont came, came to me and, and, uh, and proposed, said, would you like to come to, to GT, to Spa, with, with GT, to the 24 hours of Spa? It was like the biggest possible present because the 24 hours of Spa, even though it was touring car, Mm-hmm. was already a big event. And that was what we were missing in the world of GT racing was our headliner. Yes. That was the first divine surprise. The second divine surprise when Suzuka, representative of Suzuka, came to see me and said, could we have that, the b- biggest race of Super GT in Japan? Could the thousand kilometer of Ju- Suzuka become a round of Intercontinental? Mm-hmm. That were really, that made a big difference. I mean, when we heard that we could do this long distance race at Indianapolis, that's something we were dreaming about for years. Uh, when we had the opportunity to revive the KLM in nine hours, and I see the beautiful pictures behind you, <laughs> all of these were amazing, you know? And really today, I have to say that we have, we have the perfect intercontinental calendar. The only thing, the only remaining would be Flamand would say, okay, can we be part of the intercontinental? But it's a joke. It won't happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. Now, last question, and this is something that we ask all of our guests, Stefan. Now, I know that you've done a, a little bit behind the uh, behind the wheel in, in racing as well. We ask this every, we call it the racing genie question. And you can choose any race to compete in, in all of history, in any car you like, and with any teammate. What would you, uh, what would you choose uh, for those? Last week, we had uh, Larry Ten Vord. He chose Monaco with a Super Cup car with Ayrton Senna, for example? I would, of all the people I met in motorsport, probably one of the few, I mean, many people impressed, a number of people impressed me a lot, starting mm-hmm. with Bernie Ecclestone, uh, but Alex Zanardi. Oh, yeah. He, mm-hmm. An incredible person. A person. Yes. And I have mm-hmm. to say that racing... I should say at the 24 hours of Spa, or because <laughs> it has to be in my world. I mean, my best sporting result ever was finishing second in GT2 at the Suzuka 1,000 kilometers. Mm-hmm. So, and Le Mans. I mean, I will never forget Le Mans. I raced at Le Mans. I've been the, I will never forget these things when the sun came up. And I mean, at the time you had the Mazda RX-7, Oh. With a sound and oh. deceleration flames, like three meter flame <laughs> on the side of the cars. This is unforgettable. So, still, you know, I shouldn't say that because it's not SRO, but Le Mans with Alex Zanardi, I would go for that one. And which car would you choose? Um, 550 Maranello. Oh, the, the Pro Drive the car. Pro Drive 550 Maranello. Yeah. That one, the sound, the look, the everything, that the one. So Le Mans 550 Maranello with Alex. Oh, what a what a combination! My hero Colin McRae, he drove this car at Le Mans as, as, yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Amazing car! Yeah. Amazing car! <laughs> well, Stefan, ah, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was great to chat to you, and uh, we thank wish you. you all the best for the Kyle Ami Nine Hours next weekend. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye now. The Porsche Sport Podcast, powered by Porsche Centre Leeds. Test drive the new Porsche Taycan and experience soul electrified.